Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're so pleased to have you today on Earth Day. Today is an important day, not only to recognize Earth, that it's Earth Day, but also the announcements made by President uh, Biden this morning about decarbonization commitments that the United States will be making. So we're very excited about that in what is amounting to an incredibly historic week for many reasons, including uh, for social reasons in our country, as you all well know. So thank you so much for being with, with us today. I'm Courtney Worrell. I'm the president and CEO of the Waterfront Alliance. And we're excited to get started with this presentation and conversation about climate change and the work that we're doing. I'm, I'm here with my colleague, Kate Boycourt, who will be moving the slides for me. So I appreciate that, Kate. So we'll move to the next slide. So before we get started a bit about us, the Waterfront Alliance is an alliance of thousands of people and organizations working to change our relationship to the water and working for all communities in the New York and New Jersey region. Next slide. We do this through outreach and education, getting people on the water, and working to influence policy, laws, and regulations. One of the major focuses that we have is responding to the climate crisis. Today, Kate will talk about much of what the much of the work that we're doing, and I will talk to you about how we are framing the climate crisis, and then how that frames our approach to the work that we are doing, especially in climate change resilience. So next slide. So here is how the Waterfront Alliance is framing climate change. We see that climate change is worsening. The impacts could match those of the worst case climate models. Natural disasters are increasing and we're not investing enough in climate change mitigation or adaptation given this reality. Next slide. And unfortunately, we are off to a late start. This is partly due to the political environment of the last four years. Yet it is also due to the nature of the problem itself. Carbon dioxide is an odorless, colorless, natural and non-toxic gas for which humans are profoundly unable to see as a threat. Next slide. The evolution of the human brain over millions of years has trained us to perceive threats in the wild. That those are visual threats, threats from sound and physical impact. It's the physical impact of climate change, the damages from extreme storms, fires in the West, next slide, and the freeze in Texas that are bringing climate to us as a major threat, which we all hope will lead to greater political will for change. Next slide. There is an assumption that either technology will turn around climate change in time or that we'll be able to build our way out of the problem. The fact is, and I'm sure many of you already know, that, know this, that even with substantial reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, the climate will continue to change. If we stopped emitting greenhouse gases today, the earth would continue to warm for decades. The size of the earth, its vast oceans are now responding to the past releases of, of greenhouse gases. Next slide. Adapting to climate change while we work to reduce greenhouse gas emissions go hand in hand. In fact, a significant amount of decarbonization of the grid is going to come from the water from offshore wind, which New York State and now President Biden are committed to and many other ways as well. Next slide. Yet we see unfortunately a lack of understanding of the importance of preparation res resiliency and maybe more so a lack of understanding of what that preparation is. From the environmental community we might hear, we just need to move people away from the water in order to protect people from sea level rise. Next slide. Or we hear on the other side that we just need to build better and taller seawalls. The truth is both of these solutions lie at each end of the spectrum and therefore only reflect a small part of what we need to do to prepare for the climate future. Next slide. The solutions will come in between. For example, mixes of gray and green. This means shorelines, this means the shorelines that we, that we designed will be designed possibly as you see on the left with seawalls or we'll find solutions that you see on the right with nature, bringing nature and bringing nature to our coastal edges and working with the land. The challenge ahead for the region and for society and for nonprofits like the Waterfront Alliance is to dig into the details of the middle areas between gray and green, working directly with communities most impacted to open up a wide possibility of solutions. This is important, especially as we lack a national resiliency strategy or a federal department fully responsible for climate change. Next slide. 
In fact, we, create, we face great complexity in urban and highly developed areas like the New York, New Jersey region, the amount of infrastructure, transportation systems, types of buildings, ways that people live, and the ways people make a living mean that we need a granular level of understanding of change and protections. Next slide. What makes it particularly profound is the income and quality of life disparities in our urban region. New York City and Northern New Jersey are home to some of the most disinvested communities in the United States, many of which will be impacted more than others. Next slide. In parts of our city and our and our region, red lines redlined communities. These are communities historically discriminated against and barred from living in and owning homes in the safest neighborhoods are most likely to be located in the floodplain. Next slide. In New York City, one million people live in the floodplain today. And this will worsen with climate change and sea level rise. Next slide. And one in 10 housing developments, public housing developments in New York City are currently located in the floodplain. And nature is at risk as well. 106 square miles of wetlands could be inundated and lost in New York City. That's the equivalent of 52,000 football fields. So now about our approach. We see the challenge in the New York, New Jersey region as global. Next slide. And we see the need for change in our systems. In January of this year, 3,000 scientists, including six Nobel laureates, called for far greater investments in climate change adaptation and resiliency. The declaration notes that worldwide up to 100 million people may be unable to sustain themselves due to climate change. The report calls out our failure to prepare for COVID-19 as emblematic of the lack of preparedness for climate, but with far greater and more devastating effect. The authors say, this is a watershed moment, a watershed moment for our commitment to invest in a more sustainable world. This is a watershed moment a time when we have to get it right, use the pandemic as the canary in the coal mine and heed the call of 3000 scientists for recommitment and work for systemic change. Next slide. The Waterfront Alliance believes that our changes, believes that changes to our systems are in especially in our urbanized areas, our systems of transportation, construction, zoning, land use, energy use need to be changed. We must recommit to climate preparedness connect people to the water, and see nature as a part of what will make our communities whole. Systems change that takes care of the root cause of a problem is a far better approach than fixing its symptoms, and that accounts for why we must reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And simultaneously, we must change our systems to help us better prepare for climate change. Systems change at its most impactful level requires new laws, new policies, new regulations, and political leadership. And the solutions we come up with must increase the ability of all people of every income level to, pre to be prepared for the effects of climate change. Next slide. An example of systems change is if New York City were to build its infrastructure differently, building all, all city infrastructure to withstand the worst effects of climate change before the next storm or before the next intense heat days. Those buildings and structures could last for generations despite the ravages of climate change. And what an important improvement over the current system, which provides so much funding after disasters have hap happened. This is funding that fixes the symptoms of the problem. And we are pleased to let you know that New York City gained this victory. Because of our work and our leadership of the Rise to Resilience Coalition, the New York City Council passed a law requiring the city's $90 billion infrastructure portfolio to be built to withstand the effects of climate change. We are so excited about this. Such, such systemic changes can take a long time to come about, but once they are in place, they can be a part of the fabric of the city and the region itself. Next slide. To move forward during this watershed moment, the 3,000 scientists and six Nobel laureates have called for four revolutions a revolution in policy, funding, science and nature, and education. The revolutions are called for on a global scale. For each global scale, there is a local or regional scale that mirrors it. So next we'll describe these areas of change grounded in the four revolutions. My colleague Kate will present on two of our program areas. First, the Rise to Resilience campaign, which works primarily for policy and legislative level change, where most systemic changes must take place. 
The next area is the Waterfront Alliance's design guidelines program, which mostly targets the private sector, incentivizing before laws and regulations are in place, what landowners and developments and, and what landowners and developers can do to ensure their water, waterfront projects stand the test of time and that these projects do not wall people off from the beauty and pleasures of the waterfront. And last and most importantly, we will cover our work in education, the ultimate system change to prepare the next generation who will come after us to understand, live and thrive in a world altered by climate change. And now on to Kate, take it away, Kate. Thank you, Courtney. And so as Courtney mentioned, I'm going to talk about our coalition and campaign Rise to Resilience, through which we have built more than 100 partners. And our focus is to build power by connecting this broad coalition of grassroots community organizations, labor organizations, to larger environmental and decision maker organizations. Our goal is to affect policies and investments at federal, state, and local levels that build climate resilience. To do this with such a broad group, we had to figure out what unites us, what brought, brought us together. So we work together to develop points of unity that range from making sure that infrastructure and housing is resilient to safe and future conditions, that information is transparent and there's a right to know about our risk, that all adaptation science, uh, adaptation strategies are evidence-based and community-driven, and that we're prioritizing to make sure that as we're investing, that these resources go to those who have the most risk and are viewed through a social and racial justice lens. We also want to create jobs and create solutions that protect both people and habitats. These points of unity underlie all of our policies and you can see them on our website in terms of the testimony and letters that we have sent to make change. In terms of policy and science, as Courtney mentioned, these two revolutions really inform our work. This is what we do. We are focused on policy and evidence-based and, and community-informed policy. In our inaugural year, we just launched last July, we've already passed legislation at state, local, and federal levels. Courtney touched on the New York City legislation. This is a huge deal. That means that from schools to streets, we will have to build in the future to withstand climate threats. And the coalition sees this as a pathway to making sure all private and public in the future uh, will have to withstand climate threats. At the state level in New Jersey, we work to pass a law that will now require every municipality to incorporate climate vulnerability into their master planning process. That is the key to making sure land use decisions are made well and informed by climate science. At the federal level, we had a major win. We passed legislation um, with our partners in Congress to inform a coastal risk study that could affect millions in our region. And we also got our amendments in a bill that would essentially create a, a new and most progressive flood risk disclosure law in the nation if passed in New York State. So where are we going? We'll talk a little bit about funding in a moment. That's a huge piece of this, investing up front. But at the federal level, we're also working to make improvements to agency practice and policy, that communities are better served, that we have more equitable strategies, that nature and holistic solutions are prioritized, and that we're asking and engaging communities in the process. And New Jersey just released today was a statewide resilience strategy. We're diving into that and trying to figure out whether our priorities were included as we've been expressing throughout the process to make sure that a lot of, a lot of the things that I mentioned in our points of unity are reflected. We're seeing if we can influence that New York state law and get it passed through one of our, our partners is really taking the lead at National, National Resources Defense Council. And in New York City, our primary focus is on the next mayor. We're also working on budgetary investments in resilience and trying to get a comprehensive resilience plan. These are critical steps that New York City needs to take to make sure that it is prepared to meet the climate future. 
I should say that nature underlies all of these policies from dealing with urban heat to mitigating flooding to creating, as you can see in this beautiful park, a, a place for restorative health and well being for, for communities. It needs to be part of the solution and through solving multiple challenges at once, where we can be making better, more efficient, and uh, more beneficial solutions. At the federal level of funding, as I mentioned, is a huge piece of, piece of this. We're focusing on the American Jobs Plan that was proposed. It includes a lot of our priorities, and we'd like to see it move forward. We want to do so, though, in, in making sure we're also, all of these investments are taking into account the future conditions and taking and addressing them so that we're not investing in a way that perpetuates our risk. We're also at the state level <clears throat> supportive of a bond act measure which just passed in legislation legislature this week and would be on the ballot in 2022 that could release $3 billion in New York State, a majority of which will go towards resiliency measures. We're also, as I mentioned, working on the budget, we have a, a hit list for a percentage and for of capital projects that should be invested in resiliency, as well as billions that should go towards NYCHA developments, and especially the mayor's office of resiliency, we need a captain for this process and making sure our city is adapting for the future. We reach people in other ways. We've held rallies. We, we've launched with hundreds of people in attendance and we, we did a big rally to, to pass that bill that Courtney mentioned at the city level. And we're also engaging people on a different level at a more visceral level through climate art. We commissioned three artists in, to install works at the South Street Seaport Museum last year. And it reached thousands of people through foot traffic. We're also doing that again next year in July during City of Water Day to really connect people to the problem and also potentially the solutions. And now I'm going to hit it over to Wedge, which is a program for resilient design, like lead for the waterfront. We're trying to make sure that every stretch of waterfront is resilient to climate threats, is ecologically sound and supportive of habitat, and also is publicly accessible, as you can see here in this example of a wedge verified project, Brooklyn Bridge Park. This is also a way to leverage private investment towards resiliency measures. We have verified 10 projects in multiple states. We've also uh, have a set of design guidelines that can be used to get those verified projects that we developed with the science, insurance, design, engineering, community development, uh, entities to make sure that we are having an evidence-based tool that can be used to best inform decision making at the water's edge. We also, through this program, have educated more than 200 wedge professionals in 14 states. This is how we make change through a community of professionals that is pushing for these through their clients to community engagement processes, this is really a part of the solution that also leads to policy. We've seen with a number of deeper engagement processes with at the local level, that there are different considerations about how projects are designed and even potentially how future zoning might be developed in the case of Camden, New Jersey. So I'm going to shift it back over to Courtney to step a little bit back uh, towards our most important program, our education program, where we really start from the ground up. Courtney, take it away. All right, well, thanks so much, Kate. So yes, last we're gonna describe our education program. So education is the ultimate of systemic change. It's changing hearts and minds, especially of young people. Uh, we take the next generation, mostly middle school and high school students, to waterfront parks in their community, likely a place where they've never visit, visited before to experience the park and to conduct science on the water. This is a STEM-based program with a curriculum and lab made available to all schools and educators with programs conducted by the Waterfront Alliance staff and educators. Since the program started, we have connected 2,200 students in the New York Harbor Estuary to the waterfront through these hands-on waterfront labs, and 12,000 students have had exposure to virtual opportunities this year. 
participating schools come from all New York City boroughs and, <clears throat> and uh, in New Jersey, the Estuary Explorers materials have been used in schools across the city of Elizabeth. Next slide. So go going virtual this year because of the pandemic allowed us to um, actually provide a program to students where they could keep learning at home about the environment and their estuary. Virtual science lessons, which can be done in your kitchen where you're testing salt and water quality and, and pollutants. This, these types of experience act, experiments actually do work in kitchens and they keep your, the hands-on learning going. And so we, were, we had a lot of success with this. And after the pandemic, we're going to go back to indoor and outdoor classroom-based activities while still keeping the materials available. And we hope that, and we anticipate this will keep, uh, allow, will allow students to increase their understanding of and responses to climate change. Next slide. And of course, the hope is that over time, Estuary Explorers plays a major role in empowering the next generation to meet the climate crisis, using the beauty of the waterfront as a backdrop for their voices for the change that we need while providing the tools for curiosity, exploration, and connection to the water. So that ends our presentation. Um, we've laid out the, our current understanding of the climate crisis, discussed the importance of climate resilience and adaptation, and then talked about the ways that the Waterfront Alliance is engaging in our program areas for these systemic solutions and for change. So thank you so much for joining us today, and we are really excited to work with you in the future.